NASCAR Sprint Cup Series visited Chicago Land Speedway Saturday for a day in tonight 400 mile of the daytime portion was dominated but when the sun went down the sparks began to fly. Only 17 laps to go with Jimmy Johnson and Brian Vickers on the front row. Mark Martin lines up third. Josh is sideways three wide. Jimmy Hamlin in the middle going for the race lead. And Brian Vickers all the way to the bottom. He'll take the top spot. Denny Hamlin wants a piece of this. They make contact. Vickers is into Denny Hamlin. The grandstands have absolutely erupted at Chicago Land Speedway. Mark Martin back to the lead. And a Mark Martin kind of eye down to the line. He comes. Mark Martin scored his series leading fourth win of 2009, leading 195 of 267 laps, but he sure had to work for it in the end, fighting through a series of late cautions and shootout style restarts that saw him lose the lead, get it back, and survive a late challenge from Jeff Gordon. From double file restarts becoming three wide in turn one, to pit strategies, great saves, and late crashes, our roundtable panel picks it apart next on NASCAR Now. Now is presented by the Home Depot. And from the Home Depot Garage Studios, we welcome you to the fantastic finish edition of the NASCAR Now Monday Roundtable. It's a favorite saying of mine. You never know who's going to win until the checkered flag waves. And while Mark Martin dominated Saturday night's race, there were enough twists of plot at the end to even keep old John Grisham happy for sure. We'll pick it all apart with our roundtable panel. This week we welcome Boris Said, Terry Blunt, Ricky Craven. Uh, to start, what did you enjoy most about Saturday night's race? Easy, the double file restarts. I thought those were so exciting. I'm glad NASCAR did that. Without question to me, it was seeing a so-called cookie-cutter track <laughs> that for the last 40 laps looked like a cross between a restrictor plate race at Talladega and bumper bashing at Bristol. It was, it was stunning. It was fun to see. And for me, it was the in-car camera, Mark Martin, leading the race. I just really, really got into that. We'll look at a little bit of that a little bit later on in the show, but I want to start with uh, something I'll title Double File, Triple Wide. Uh, after Mark dominated much of the night with the field pretty spread out, three late race restarts turned up the volume on the action. This was a key one. Yeah, Jimmy Johnson just used the momentum on the outside and uh, got the jump on Mark. That was with 35 to go. Uh, and then even a little more action on the next restart when they went three wide and Johnson got shuffled out. Yeah, I think this time Denny Hammond got into Johnson, pushed him aside, and then it looked like it was going to be Denny Hammond's show. So that allows Mark Martin to go back through to the lead. Then the final restart with two to go, Ricky. Now it's Jeff Gordon alongside, but not for long. And Mark switches lanes. He restarts on the outside and says, once, shame on you, twice, shame on me. <laughs> I'm going to see if this works. And in fact, it did. So Martin comes out on top at Chicagoland. Here's the deal. I don't care what you say. To put it plainly, the double file restart is in effect to mess up the best car. That's what it is. How are you going to make it more exciting? Well, you're going to make the guy that should have won the race have to work for it, earn it, or mess him up or whatever. And that's kind of what happened today. Well, I really dodged a bullet that second time down there because I wasn't going to let him beat me out of that corner uh, until I almost cleaned us out. You know, Mark's intelligence. Uh, and patience, you know, showed through again when those guys got to racing really hard. I think he could have been right in the middle of that if he chose to. Uh, but he's he's really, really smart, knows what's going to happen, and uh, he, he kind of backed out and drove on by him. Mark put on an unbelievable performance tonight, and to see him get four four wins this year is pretty phenomenal. Uh, he's, just a, he's just an awesome talent, he and Allen. A great combination. They just get better and better every week. That team is really gelled, so that's no surprise to me. You know, I, I, I guess maybe a little bit of a surprise if you'd asked me going into the season how fast they would gel and how many races they would have won at this point. But since the season started, no, those guys are strong. And Mark's such a talented race car driver. I knew he was going to win. If I was a gambling man, I would have put money on him. But, uh, you know, because he was a sure bet the way he was running in practice. I'm telling you, that man, is, uh, he, he hasn't lost anything. He's in his prime still. He's been in his prime for 30 years now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Uh, the 1 2 finish for Hendrick Motorsports Saturday night was the 27th in team history 
And the fourth in 2009, and of those four, three have been won by Mark, the other by Jeff Gordon. At Texas, only one other team has scored a 1-2 finish this season. That was Joe Gibbs Racing at Bristol. So lots to go through here. Let's start with lane choice for Mark on those restarts. He chose the inside lane as the leader for three restarts with Jimmy Johnson to his outside and managed to hold off Jimmy. But then on that fourth one with 35 to go, something played out differently that allowed Jimmy to get by him. I think Jimmy just really, he got the jump on him. You know, he got a good jump on him, and he used the outside to carry that momentum. And I think Mark Martin learns from that, and that's why he changed his mind later. And I thought the interesting thing, when, when they went off into the corner side by side, here's that old racer's hands thing again. But you saw Mark's car down low break loose and start to wiggle. Yeah, because that has an effect on the right rear of the car, and that's vulnerable for the drivers. They don't like that feel. They have to roll out of the gas. So Mark learned from that and wasn't going to allow it to happen at the end. I tell you, Alan, what I love about it is you don't know what they're going to do till a few seconds before they take the green flag. I mean, Mark Martin and Alan Gustafson were actually deciding just as they lined up whether they were going to go outside or inside. That extra bit of drama and strategy is great for the fans and great to see. It just really added something to the race. And that was interesting for this last restart, how Mark chose the outside to try and get away from Jeff Gordon. Because Mark, typically, he's an inside guy. He's always running at the bottom, you know, compared to a guy like uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. is always running against the wall at the top. So I was surprised he did it. You're absolutely right. I think part of it was the tires were aging and there was less grip and he might not be able to stay on the bottom and a little bit of what he had learned from the previous restart. Mark dominated the first three quarters of the race. I mean, except for during exchanges of green flag pit stops, he led nonstop from lap 42 to lap 223. And Ricky, while watching him lead that part of the race from the onboard video from, from inside the five car, you found some things interesting. Yeah, in the last year and a half, we've discovered that you need to be loose to be fast in this car. And Mark has always had the, the history of, of running a loose car, driving off the right rear, where the right rear leaned out a little bit. His hand's right here at 10 o'clock, and he turns to 9 o'clock in the corner. Folks, that's not much. In other words, he has his car set up so it leads itself down in the corner, and then he can correct if he needs to. But uh, there, aren't many there aren't many drivers that can do that right there. I think they need to make a rule where every driver needs to run a clear shield, because I think it's so cool <laughs> that you look up there and see his eyes, how intense he looked when he was driving. I, I really like that. I don't think I've ever seen a time where a guy actually said early in the race that, wow, this is easy. Let me know when you want me to put the hammer down. And he's already up by three seconds at that point. Yeah. So that's how good it was. And I agree with that. And again, that speaks to Mark Martin during practice. Remember, he, they got there somehow, right? And his ability to give feedback to Alan, say, this is what I need. We're close. We're close. We're there. And leave it alone. Yeah, he did say during practice, he goes, we could have quit an hour early and we still would have been mm -hmm. fine. Yeah, it's amazing. We'll follow up on some of this with Mark when he joined us on NASCAR Now at the bottom of the hour. I want to look at some of the hard physical racing that took place after some of those late race restarts as well. Uh, start of the restart with 17 to go. Jimmy Johnson's leading. Denny Hamlin is lined up behind him going into turn one. The bump drafting was last week. <laughs> was this week. No, I think it was in Chicagoland. It looked like he was going to steal the show here and then Brian Vickers got a little loose on the inside here you can see the cars just sucked him around and gave Mark Martin the opening he needed. Man, Boyer had the check up there, so that was that one. Now, a lap later, Hamlin and Vickers tangle racing for the lead, which opened the door for Mark. And everything we spoke to, the guy on the inside is vulnerable. And I think right there is when Mark Martin learned, I don't want to be on the inside next to Jeff Gordon. That's why he put Jeff Gordon in that spot right. in that last restart. Really showed his patience there. Let them settle this, and then I'll just go on by here after they do whatever they're going to do. It was the last restart. We knew it was probably going to be for the end of the race. Uh, you know, I don't know what happened between him and Jimmy. I don't know if Jimmy just got loose or he got into Jimmy. Um, I thought we had him cleared coming off the two, but he, he hung in there on our right rear, and he did his job. You know, he was he was pretty tight. <laughs> uh, too tight for his good and my good. Uh, you know, ended up getting us really loose, and I don't know if he got into us or not, but uh, it was just hard racing. Put myself in position to win right there. Just uh, got, getting between the 48 and the 5. Just uh, the 83 couldn't hold it down below us, and, you know, just racing hard for the win. And, I, the guy on the inside's at the mercy of the guy on the outside. You know, you can only really run into the corner so hard, and uh, you know, just we held him tight, and uh, <laughs> he got into us and knocked us up the track. But that was uh, that's double file restarts. That's uh, you know, it w we wouldn't have been in position to win that race if it wasn't for that. And um, you know, we we took advantage of every opportunity we had tonight. Get your reactions to something. When I listened to the drivers speak like that after the race, I thought they're all talking about good hard racing. Good for all them. 
You know, it wasn't, oh, he did that. You know, I just thought they, they, it was good, hard racing. They were all going for the win, and that was the spirit that they all took it in. These double re file restarts are so intense. I mean, it's like at Sonoma when we were doing it, it was completely crazy, but it was fun. And we were all getting into each other, and no one was even calling names out there. So I love watching it. Well, there was plenty of name calling after yeah. that thing ended, but I think they all understand. Look, this is here to stay. This is the fans love this, and I have noticed one thing they said after the race uh, to us is that they're getting more aggressive as they get used to this. They're starting to drive harder and harder as the as we go to race after race, and we have more races with the double file restart. So it may continue to get even better than it already is. Now, the biggest tension between drivers after the race, at least verbally, was probably Kurt Busch and Jimmy Johnson, who. Remember, have had their run-ins a couple times already this season. Well, this was contact with 16 to go that cost them both some finishing spots. Knock, knock. You know what? <laughs> you, you can't create a rivalry. It's made when one driver takes something from another. And maybe we saw that a few weeks ago on the road course. This is an extension of it. These guys just find each other, and it's probably going to happen again. I think the 24 got inside of me and got me loose because he got new tires and two and I touched and he body slammed me after that. So that was the least of my problems. The bigger problem I had was when I was leading and the 11 pushed me all the way through one and two and eventually um, I lost control of the car and that's what put me back there. But um, everybody was out of control back in their race and body slamming. Uh, 83 and the 11 went at it for a little bit. Um, we were bump drafting down straightaways and that was some wild racing. I didn't think we could race like that on a mile and a half. It looked like the 48 just ran out of room and uh, we, we got spun together at uh, Sonoma and got hit here again. Trying to decide what's going on with the 48. I've lost a little bit of respect for him. I gave him room. He pounded us into the fence coming off turn four um, and we had a tire rub. Luckily we got a yellow to come in and fix it instead of fencing it and finished 17th. I mean, we we're running 8th to 12th, had an okay car. Uh, but when he had that bad restart, man, he was like a ping pong ball just bouncing off of guys. All right, so those are probably the hardest feelings expressed, at least publicly anyway, uh, after the race. Thoughts on what happened? I just think with these double file restarts, there's going to be a lot less Christmas cards going out this year. <laughs> That's just hard racing, and uh, it's exciting for the fans. If yep. I wouldn't have known, I would have thought we were in Bristol. Yeah. I would have, you know, if I wouldn't know what track it was at. And with the cars lined up the old way, with the lap down cars, you might lose a spot, maybe two. In this case, when you lose three or four spots in less than a half lap, I think the driver's intensity goes up maybe a little too quick. And, and we're watching it in slow motion. They're going 190 miles an hour when they're hitting each other. I think the tendency is for the drivers to get it back in one corner, and that's a recipe for disaster. And isn't it funny how when drivers seem to get on these runs of being together, you know, I mean, this is three times in four races. Those two guys have gotten together, and then, you know, they'll end up parked next to each other in the garage right. next week. Got to love that about this sport. It just always <laughs> seems to happen. Our uh, Sports Nation poll question tonight is, which 09 race winner is most likely to miss the chase? You've got Kyle Busch, Mark Martin, and Matt Kenseth near the bottom of the chase standings. The guys with the most wins this season. Uh, three of the four, anyway. So uh, log on to ESPN.com, cast your vote, and we'll have results in a discussion with our panel later in the show. Coming up, we will look at the race to the chase. Some late Saturday wrecks put some pressure on that bubble for some. A discussion in just a couple of minutes. We'll also look at the adventure field night. The championship leaders, Tony Stewart and Jeff Gordon, had at Chicagoland. Great stuff for both. And later, the winner of Saturday Night's Race, Mark Martin, joins us to talk about it. That and more still to come on the NASCAR Now Monday Roundtable. All-Star Game. See it live tonight, only on ESPN America. Texas Western takes the first major sports title the school has ever won. In one of the biggest upsets in NCAA men's hockey history. Look at her, the magic just... And now you can see it too the greatest college sports video library of all time. Introducing the new NCAA.com, the official site of college sports.
for live commentary, news and stats, scrum.com. Instant rugby anywhere. Sign up to the ESPN America newsletter and be the first to know all about the best matchups for the month ahead. Get the latest news from the players and the teams who are making the headlines. He swings and hits one! Be the first to view the exclusive offers from our online shop and win lots of prizes in our exclusive competitions and promotions. All from the only channel dedicated to North American sports. Visit ESPNAmerica.com for more details and scheduling information. Strategy and some hard driving helped a couple guys end up with great nights. Jeff Gordon and Carl Edwards nearly wrecked racing for position here at lap 138. Great driving, guys. I'm not sure how they saved those. Sideways cars. at 190. Pretty <laughs> cool. That's something. Watch this. Yeah. Then under caution at lap 248, those two were among eight lead lap cars called to pit road for fresh tires. Bold call here by Steve Letarte. I think it was a great call, and, uh, and it obviously helped. Uh, then when the other guys got knocking around in front of him, Jeff Gordon hung a left. Yeah. I'll take those spots. While well, you guys are sparring, I'm going to slide <laughs> by. Jeff Gordon saying, thanks for no out-of-bounds line there. Yep, passed Denny Hamlin for second with 10 to go. Had a shot at Mark Martin on the final restart, but wound up having to take second place money on the night. As we showed you, Mark got away. Yeah, we showed the night before when Joe Ligano won the Nationwide race with old tires. He held off the guys with newer tires. Same tonight. Tony Stewart started 32nd, raced his way up into the top 10 by lap 55, uh, led a lap during green flag pit stops at lap 96, and just had a super race car. And it's what we've come to expect of Tony Stewart. He's, he's been resilient all year, been fast, and he re recovers again. But after working his way all the way to the front, has to go to the back twice. First at lap 212. Um, you got to have all those lug nuts attached before you leave pit road, so he has to come back in for that one, goes back of the line. Then, under caution, just after a pit stop, cuts down a tire, has to pit again, goes to the back of the lead lap cars. Uh, Gordon, uh, Stewart rather, using the same late race strategy as Gordon, stopped at 248, got the fresh tires, raced his way through all the mayhem, and Tony Stewart comes up with fourth place money. Does he does he race Ryan Newman any harder the knowing key it's was, his? You know, since he took the outside and my car worked better on the inside, and I think his did too, was to, to at least be at his rear bumper going into turn one. But he, he took off early and I spun the tires. And, you know, at that point, it, it was kind of a, a desperate effort. And then the nine got to the outside of me. I, I mean, I didn't know where that came from. It surprised me and really, uh, you know, put us in a position just to fight hard to get second. Solid night, and then it got to be really bad, and then it got really good at the end there. So uh, I'll, I'll, take a, I'll take a fourth place tonight with where we were with about 30 to go. When you can have two cars, fourth and sixth, I mean, you can't call it a bad night. So uh, I know Ryan got, they got back a little bit at the beginning there, and it looks like they uh, got their way worked back up at the end too. So really proud of both of these teams for being able to climb as hard as they did at the end of the night. You know what? I didn't even realize Stuart was that close to Menard's wreck until I just saw that right there. <laughs> had quite a yeah. night going, didn't he? Yeah. 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 Uh, was there something you were trying to say? <laughs> I, I was just wondering that. I wonder if Tony Stewart races Ryan Newman any harder now that he knows it's his car and he's got to pay the bills. No, yeah, you never know. <laughs> First thing, back to Gordon and Edwards. How did they save those race cars? That was something. I'm going to tell you, that it was something. And from Paul Edwards' standpoint, he knows if he overcorrects, he's taking Gordon out. Gordon is depending on his spot because he can't see Paul at that point. But Gordon was sideways for 100 yards right there. <laughs> I almost think on the restart, these guys are thinking, well, I know somebody's going to hit me or I'm going to hit somebody, so I'm going to be ready for this. That was incredible. So great job of driving by both of them there and, uh, and great saves. The strategy, when Gordon and Stewart stopped at lap 248, then ripped through the chaos on fresher tires, what did you think at the time of the call to pit and the call by Martin's team not to stop? I thought Martin was in trouble, frankly. I, I didn't think he could stay up there without changing the tires to get four tires. But, I mean, if you're, if you're up front, you, that's a chance you have to take. I, mean, yeah. I disagree, though. The night before, we saw Joey Logano was the only guy not to pit. Everyone thought he was dead in the water with Kyle Busch with four fresh tires, and he went on and pulled away. So yeah, but I you, think Mark made the smart call. You, you might have seen Logano do that the night before, but did you really think that that was the exception of the rule? Uh, the way Mark Martin's I, I car was all night on those old tires, I thought it was the right call. And the clean air seems always to be important. I think he could have had Flintstone tires. Yeah. <laughs> all right, agree or disagree. The shootout-style double-file restarts took some of the sting 
out of Tony Stewart's two extra pit stops. Oh, it absolutely helped. And along with that, I want to give credit to the fact that his experience, he knew he had a tire going down under caution. Let me tell you, folks, you know when drivers normally know they have a tire going down under caution? When they go green and they whistle down in the corner. So that was a big <laughs> save. It would have put him down a lap. He yes. would have been out of it. Yes. So with the great finishes for Gordon and Stewart, we look at the top of the NASCAR Spring Cup Series championship standings and see that Tony leads Jeff by 175 points. Tony has two wins. Jeff won. Thinking ahead to the reseeding, by the way. Uh, the top four in points did not change places after the Chicago Land race. Denny Hamlin did move up a spot to fifth. Coming up next, cautions breed cautions. The old saying, so true, we'll look at more of the late race mayhem made uh, Saturday night and how it made the finish pretty fun. And we'll dig deeper into the championship from eighth on down and how Saturday's race impacted, pun intended, the race to the chase. Tonight on ESPN America, A uniform says a lot about you. It can say you've made it. Or that you're on your way. But where you end up is entirely up to you. Pardon the interruption, but I am Mike Wilbon. And I'm Tony Kornheiser, and they have asked us to explain our show, PTI. It's two veteran sports writers discussing the major American sports issues of the day. And I occasionally wear a sundress. Whew. Please, watch us anyway on ESPN America. Where are my earrings? Have you seen my earrings? I don't know. Really? PTI. For the opening 211 laps of Saturday's race, only three cautions all for debris. Then it was on. Unbelievable here. And this car, when after it hit, I know you're telling me it's the lights and the mirrors, but there seemed to be a lot of smoke in this car, and it seemed like it took him a long time to get out. Uh, Sam Hornish got spun out of traffic there. Then Paul Menard got squeezed in a three-wide off turn four. Very disappointing for Paul Menard, Alan. I mean, he was going to have a top ten finish, one of his best races of the year, and to have this happen, boy, you just think, uh, I can't win. And it became a no-win situation for Jeff Burton and Scott Speed and Jamie McMurray <laughs> right there. Not a great way to meet. No. Uh, David Rudiman in the double zero, lap 246, got squeezed also. Yeah, we saw this so many times throughout the night. The guy on the inside loses grip at the most important part of the corner. Slides up into the guy on his outside. And uh, troubles there for Rudiman. And finally, with seven to go, Kyle Bush in the 18, loses an engine, crashes in turn three. While Bush's engine was a different matter, much of the other contact came after the double file restarts. There's days like today where it was frustrating. You know what? Hey, I, I made up two or three spots because I was on the outside because of double file restarts. If it had been single file, I may not have gotten a couple of those spots we got there at the end. But I also lost a few at the end because of it. So I think that's just how it's going to be. I think you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. But it's going to be one hell of a show. It was pretty messy up there tonight. I think we're all starting to get comfortable with it and starting to push the issue with each other. We'll get better at it. I think it's definitely more exciting for the fans. I think it's something the driver's going to have to deal with. Uh, it's not meant to be easy out there. It's meant to be the best and hardest race in the world, and I think NASCAR are trying their best to make it that way. I like it, and it's exciting. We're all going to be pretty mad at each other by the end of this deal. Everybody just runs over each other and drives like a jerk, but that's what you got to do. I mean, double file restarts, you see an opportunity to uh, advance your position at the expense of however many you're going to do it. There ain't a driver out there that won't. Four weeks in a row, double file restarts. We've been in a wreck. A wreck's been in front of us all four weeks, and we've been in those wrecks every time. And uh, I know it's exciting to watch, but from my perspective, it's not a really good thing right now. 
<laughs> All right. Uh, a lot of different thoughts there contained in that. Any reaction to what you just heard? No, I just think that's what you're going to see. You're going to see some guy win from the double file restarts and some guys that lose a lot of spots or get wrecked out. And it's not great for them, but it sure is exciting for the fans. And it's double difficult when you've run 80% of the race, maybe 90% of the race, and get crashed. It's different than crashing early, and that's what you heard. I got to tell you guys, I can't wait to get, Indiana get to Indianapolis oh, and yeah. see going into that turn one 90 degree angle with oh, a double yeah. file restart with 10 laps to go. That's going to be something to see. We've both gone into turn one at 200 miles an hour. <laughs> it's hard enough by yourself. It? Well, it looks like a mouse hole coming off of turn four. There's no room at all. But I think there it's going to get separated out pretty quick. Yeah. With the intensity of these races in the late laps anyway being high, even before they went to the shootout style restarts, do you think that the, the intensity of the racing we're seeing is really any different than it was? before the shootout style restarts? I do, because I think that if you listen to what the drivers are saying and you believe what they're saying, they're saying, look, when it comes down to the end, if there's, if there's a restart, we're just taking what we can get. Forget personal feelings. <laughs> forget who's your friend, who's your teammate. Take what you can get. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit like it, restrictor plate. It doesn't matter who your teammate is. In the end, you've got to go where you think you can go to get the best situation, and that's what they're doing. I lived it at Infineon, and I'm telling you, if you're not aggressive, you're going to lose a lot of spots, and it is so intense, and it's a lot of fun, I think, so I'm all for it. The only thing I could think of when, when I heard a couple of those things, uh, I think it might have been Junior's piece there, have you been in rush hour traffic on an interstate in any major city these days? People running all over each other and not be. That's kind of what it's like yeah. on the roads anyway. So yeah. what's the difference yeah. if it's on the racetrack? Uh, the results of this race and their implications now on the race to the chase. Casey Kane finished third Saturday, moved up four places to eighth in the standings. He's 51 points ahead of 13th place. Juan Pablo Montoya came back from a lap down to finish 10th at Chicagoland, moves up two spots to ninth. He is 36 near points to the good. Uh, Kyle Busch, his late engine problem, left him with a 33rd place finish. Dropped him two spots in the standings to 10th. He's only 13 points ahead of 13th with seven to go. On the other side of the coin, race winner Mark Martin gained two spots to 11th, but is only 11 points inside the chase, despite winning more races than anyone so far this year. And then there's Matt Kenseth. He won the opening two races this year, but has only five top tens in the 17 races since. Matt's 12th, 10 points ahead of 13th, with seven races to go. There you go, 8 through 14th, only separated by 117 points. A couple other notes from Saturday. Greg Biffle finishing 31st, cost him four spots in the standings, while Jeff Burton caught up in that wreck. He's 182 points out of the chase with seven races to go. Still to come, Friday night's NASCAR Nationwide Series win at Chicagoland by Joey Logano. Strategy and late race restarts played in that one as well. But up next, the winner of the race, Mark Martin, joins us on the NASCAR Now Monday Roundtable. We'll see what he's got to say on this Monday. For some, Sunday might be a night to rest. But on ESPN America, Cooper hits it a mile to left. It's a night of action-packed entertainment on the diamond. Bay going back, and that's a corner. The hard-hitting action and thrills of a Hollywood blockbuster. A great catch by Fernando Martino. And the Mets win. Get your entertainment fixed this Sunday with Mets at Braves on ESPN America. Just a simple dream, you know. Ah! It's time. Spread your wings and fly to the sky. It's time. One of my memories of uh, Rebecca was uh, in a blue dress and her fluffy f slippers running up the garden with a look of sheer delight on her, on her face because the guinea pigs have been born. At seven years of age, she came in and said if anything ever happened, she wanted to be a donor. The important thing is to talk about it as a family, not just to sign up and then forget about it. You want it. And for us, we'd have failed Rebecca if we hadn't have done it. I mean, you can't change tragedy. Mm. You can't change it, but you can make something more positive out of it. Because for us, it wasn't just a wasted life. It's, it's, it's a gift, mm. it's a, and it's an altruistic gift. Enormously. Right from the word go. Yeah.
Hey there, Horners. You've come to the right place to get your daily fix of American sports news right here on ESPN America. Why don't you tell the upstanding folks of Europe what they had to look forward to. Hey, you got my the Lakers are going to be great. The Lakers, the Lakers. That's what you have to look forward to. Around the Horn weekdays on ESPN America. American for sports. Horn me! A number of guys are just outside that top 12 needing to make something happen. You know, you want to stand on the gas, you want to go for the win, but yet you want to stay in the points and leave here as high in the rankings as you can. The pressure is on big time. Try to help me, make no mistakes. I'll try to help you guys. Yeah, tip four. We'll do it all night long here, bud. Here they come. The team Red Bull cars lined up as the green goes in the air and Vickers hits the jump. Vickers has spread it away at the drop of the green flag, but now he's got company. The low Chevrolet, Jimmy Johnson right there. Try some different lines and stuff here. Tip four. Jimmy Johnson is up alongside this time, and he'll make the pass. Let's settle in here, try to get some good laps. Jimmy Johnson leading this race with ease, but he is not the fastest car on the racetrack. The five car is the fastest car out there, but he's the only car on the racetrack faster than you. We need to lead as many as we can, but take care of it. Sun is setting. The lights are on here at Chicago Land Speedway, and uh, Mark Martin right now is loving it in the moonlight. Oh, this is easy, bud. If you want me to put the hammer down, I'll pull on out. Nights like this just don't happen very often where you have got the field as completely covered as Mark appears to have. Hey, Mark, you know the Boston 60 is coming up, right? We're going to get him a big present. Yeah. It's not done yet, though. These things are really hard to win, but it's still fun. Yeah, I'm kind of having a good time tonight, too. It's good, boss. Kyle Busch has just about knocked down the wall in turn three. Stay with the front, loose with the back, stay behind cars, loose behind cars. It's Kyle Busch. I can't stand to drive these cars anymore. Kyle Busch teetering on the brake, being out of the chase right now. Get ready to get back at it here at Chicago Land. Green flag in the air. Jimmy Johnson's there. This time he climbs the banking. They'll go wheel to wheel. Jimmy Johnson in the race lead. Wow. Oh, it's nice. Mark Martin, who has dominated all night long, has just got the drop kicked all the way back to the third position. We'll get him back. Don't worry about it. I think radio silence to be in order right now. War's on. 10-4. Johnson sideways three wide. Jimmy Hamlin in the middle going for the race lead. And Brian Vickers all the way to the bottom. He'll take the top spot. Still there with the 11. Still there with the 11. They make contact. Vickers is into Denny Hamlin. Here comes Martin. Martin takes the top spot. This car is running out front right now. Mark Martin pins it to the bottom of the track. He stops the buddy. You're the man, baby. Checkered flag is out. Mark Martin wins. I can't believe it. Man, that's big. That is big. We won, right? Mark, you didn't win. You crushed the baby. Yeah. If you look at the seating for the chase, right now Mark Martin would be leading the way due to his four wins this year. Kyle Busch would be seated second, while Tony Stewart, who leads the standings now, would be the third seed. He said if he kept winning races, he'd keep joining us on Mondays to talk about it. And he's a man of his word, the winner of Saturday night's Chicago Land Race for the NASCAR Sprint Cup Series. Mark Martin joining us from his home base in Daytona Beach, Florida. Mark, thank you for the time again, and congratulations. Thank you, man. It's good to be back with you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great occasion. You know, you led so yes. much of the race. You led from basically lap 42 to 223 without stop, except during green flag pit stops. Even commented at one point on how easy it was, the way your car was performing. So what was the difference at the end when it got so tough for you with Jimmy Johnson and all those other guys? Double file restarts, um, you know, and our car was exceptional on long, uh, long green flag runs. Um, I would have to run hard for, you know, 10, 15, uh, 20 laps or so. And then, you know, after that, it was just uh, a cake after that. So um, we didn't get a lot of those short runs early in the race. And, uh, I, you know, I knew it was coming. It always does, all the cautions at the end. Um, you know, and, um, you know, we had to earn it. It was, uh, it was hard work. You, you're talking about Jimmy Johnson. You're talking about Superman <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, man, he was throwing everything he had at me and, and, uh, you know, just that inside lane down there on cold tires, uh, sucked the back end around. He knew what he was doing. 
And, uh, you know, so uh, we had to go earn it. And then you had to hold off Jeff Gordon on the last restart and chose that outside lane. And I was fascinated listening to the radio conversation between you and Alan Gustafson on the telecast about what a difficult decision this must have become now and a new wrinkle to your racing. How difficult was that? It's pretty difficult because I don't like the outside at all. And, uh, you know, I, I, I really hate giving up the inside. But obviously, uh, you know, we both knew that, uh, you know, with Jeff with fresh tires uh, or much fresher tires than we had, um, you know, sticking him on my right rear quarter panel going into turn one was going to be a handful. And, uh, and so we chose to try to battle it from the other side. And, uh, and we just got a great start. Our car had, had actually got good starts all night. And we got a great start. And, uh, you know, you don't want to let yourself believe this, but Jeff wasn't coming even on the new tires. Once he got into second before that caution came out, I had Alan calling the lap times and we had already evened out. So, you know, my car was just really spectacular. Um, and, uh, and, and Alan is just, you know, it's just a dream to work. I think all us guys, uh, this team really, really do love each other. And, uh, you know, we, we really feel a lot of, of, uh, of camaraderie and um, it just makes it fun to go to the race every weekend. I want to back up and talk about the early part of the race for just a minute. At one point, we also heard a radio conversation basically with you telling Alan, this is easy, this car is so good. When you're out front like that and you've got a car that's that good, but you know the end of the race is still lying ahead of you, are you one of those guys that, that, that uh, I want to say, gets worried about the end of the race while you're still in the middle of it with a car that good? Well, Alan, I've been doing this stuff a long time, and I've had more than two or three good race cars, and uh, I've lost way more races than I've won. So, <laughs> you know, they're never, they're, you know, to me, they're never won until they're won. And then even after we took the checkered flag, I still couldn't believe it and had to ask them if had we really won that race. So, uh, you know, I, I know better than to count uh, my chickens before they hatch. Uh, and by the way, that was about 30 laps into a set of tires. Uh, at that time, so the car was at its very best, and, and it was just uh, it was just incredible. So, you know, I was just uh, letting him know that I could run uh, easier or harder, anything they really wanted me to do, and I was just encouraging Alan to have some input on 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 our race. Uh, you know, he's so bright, um, and and the more that I can get him involved in in the race and in the part that I'm doing, I think the better uh, and more effective we will be. Mark, you uh, were talking about Rick Hendrick's birthday uh, in Victory Lane on uh, Saturday night. Uh, what's, it, what's your relationship like with Rick, and how has it changed in the six months or so that you've been driving for him? Well, you know, Rick has always been a, a great person. Um, you know, I didn't have a close relationship with him until I started working with him actually uh, a couple of years ago when they put me in his, uh, in, in his bush car, and I had opportunity to work with Alan. Um, you know, we got to know each other better. He's just really a really, really special person. Um, uh, and, you know, Rick Hendrick is really having fun with this. Uh, he and Jeff Gordon both, uh, because, you know, um, they both, uh, knew that we could do this, uh, but a lot of people would have told them that it couldn't be done. So I think they're enjoying doing what, uh, some people thought couldn't be done. Uh, real special relationship with both those guys. Um, I think Rick encourages everyone around him to be uh, just better people. Um, I think, you know, people love to work for him, and I certainly do. I don't think he's the only one having fun with, uh, with what's going on. I think you're probably having a pretty good time, too. Uh, a week off, then one of the sport's big prizes out in front of you, Indianapolis. A thought on the Brickyard before we go? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, we did the first uh, Goodyear tire test last year with the five car. It was my first chance to drive uh, their car there, and, and uh, it was obscene how fast it was. Uh, we haven't been invited back the six tire tests or so that they've done since, so I don't know how we will stack up. But we have every expectation to go in there and, and, uh, and race our teammates for sure for, for that thing and, and, uh, and everyone else. So. 
Uh, I'm really excited about it, uh, especially Indy. That would be uh, one that I'd love to see. Uh, Kellogg's Car Quest and all the guys uh, on the five car kissing the bricks. And, and if you win it, you'll talk to us the next day, which we like too. You can count on it. <laughs> Mark, congratulations. Super, super season so far. Four wins, most of any other driver. And we wish you continued good luck as you uh, pursue that Indianapolis win a week from Sunday. Thank you. Can you really just call his race car obscenely fast? Uh, in our hot lap segment, we'll talk about some of the people who need to get it going again to make the chase and have a shot at the title. But next, Joey Logano got it going Friday night in the Nationwide Series race at Chicago Land. Highlights and discussion when the NASCAR Now Monday Roundtable continues. thousand NCAA student athletes and just about all of us will be going pro in something other than sports for the widest choice of official North American sports merchandise for the perfect gift to collect or just to look good and support your team visit ESPNAmerica.com Every Saturday, ESPN America brings you the game of the week. Get a second chance to catch the game everyone's been talking about. with a walk-off home run. ESPN America's game of the week. Check ESPNAmerica.com for more details. night, 300 miles at Chicago Land for the NASCAR Nationwide Series. Carl Edwards started on pole, but the finish wouldn't be the Carl and Kyle show. It'd be the Kyle and Joey show. Lugano led a lot early. Kyle dominated the second half of the race, leading from laps 94 to 174, including having a four-second lead over Logano after these lap 152 pit stops. But Logano ran him down and passed him with 25 to go. Now, these two cars are in a league of their own, and Joey Logano right now passing Kyle Busch has got to give him a lot of confidence. So Logano runs out to a three-second lead, a lead that was erased by caution for debris with 15 to go on this yellow, a little strategy play. Kyle's team chooses to pit for tires. Logano did not. And any reasonable person would have to have believed that that was going to be a game changer. Uh, except Joey Logano on the restart with nine to go, who just wouldn't give in. Absolutely stunning that he stayed out there and still won the race. I mean, it really shows what you can do on this track, uh, you know, with this car. Joey Logano with his third win of the season. It's awesome. If you look at every one of my victories, it's been a one-two finish uh, between me and Kyle. So that's uh, that's pretty neat. And even you know last last race or uh, New Hampshire, we uh, we finished first and set for one two. So uh, that's awesome for Joe Gibbs Racing. About two laps after the restart, if I could have gotten to his outside there, I might have had it. But um, just could never make the move on him. You know his car was really strong tonight. Ours wasn't, and uh, you know it just wasn't the best car. So Joey had that by far, and it's unfortunate we had to settle for second tonight. Uh, 36 lap older tires, by the way, that he got away and won that race. Uh, talk about two guys getting pretty equal results from the same team. In the 15 Nationwide Series races that Kyle and Joey have both competed in, Bush has four wins, Logano three. Both have 10 top five finishes. Both have an average finish of fifth. And by the way, of all of the three races Logano has won, as Joey said, Kyle has finished second each time. Up next... Hot laps, where we touch on some of the week's most discussed topics. Yes, Dale Jr. figures, <laughs> figures into there this time. On that when the NASCAR Now Monday Roundtable returns. Tonight on ESPN America. Sporting events in Switzerland do not get any bigger than the annual Hornusen Festival. Hornusen employs some of the most esoteric equipment around. The bat, 
which is a cane made out of fiberglass, carries a wooden weight called the traff. A curved metal rail called a buck is used to hold the puck-like object called the hornus. The feelers use a shindle, a flat wooden shovel, to stop the hornus while in full flight, limiting the amount of points scored by the striker. And as for their methods of fielding, well, let's say they're pretty extreme. To the unfamiliar sports fan, this might all look a bit archaic as they toss these big panels up in the air or do everything they can to catch the puck mid-flight. Offensive players in the meantime try to do their best to hit the Hornus as far as they can as the point system is based on distance. In the past, points were awarded if a striker tried to hit a fielder, but now the focus is oriented more towards skill. This is what makes the sport a beautiful spectacle for all the fans to enjoy. Like any other competition, there can be only one champion. But in the end, they're all winners as they succeed in keeping the tradition of Hornusen's importance in Swiss cultural life as it's a symbol for this country's unity and its people's diversity for over 700 years. Stay tuned for more amazing games here on ESPN. E60. What's up, this is your boy Dwight Howard. I want y'all to join me. We're gonna have fun today. To some hot cookies for you guys. Enjoy yourself. You can't wear the Spider-Man shirt, it gotta be Superman. Me? Which one am I? Like Howard. <laughs> oh, I heard of that dude. That's the tall guy who did the Superman thing. Y'all can't see the secret right now. He's gonna do a secret to my hair. NBA's best dress. Uh, well, before this year, I think it was you know Kobe or LeBron. But this year, I have to say, uh, I took the crowd home. <laughs> hey, Hurricane, you teach me how to box when we finish. So you see the Hurricane, that's him right there in the flesh. The Hurricane. I heard it doing the Hurricane, too. The movie. Yeah, you didn't know that I was... This should be the stunt the part. I'm up for the part. It's a new style right here. Yeah, really. The ripped shirt. Jeez. What I do for fun, I watch movies. Aki, what would you like to call? 2547. Please, please. You better get down, do it now. Get in the Who's the master? <laughs> you don't have the glow, Leroy. Kiss my Adidas, Leroy. We had ESPN, the magazine photo shoot. I want to make love to the pictures while I'm taking them. Don't miss E60 on ESPN America. Watch the best live sports action online 24-7. Don't miss a minute of your favorite sports wherever you are, whenever you want it. Get the latest news, highlights, and analysis, and full live game coverage. Simply choose a package that suits you to watch the NHL or NCAA basketball live online this season. Go to ESPN360.com and watch live sports online 24-7 now. And now on ESPN.com, David Newton writes how this weekend's race may have sparked a Kurt Busch-Jimmy Johnson feud and why their bad blood would be good for NASCAR. This year it's just been a struggle. Everything's been so hard. It's just so hard to gain any track position. It's just so hard to uh, finish a race in the top five, uh, let alone even in the top ten. You know, it's just I don't even know how we're ninth in points with what our finishes have been lately. I mean, it's just pathetic. Hot laps has spin through some talked about topics of the week with our roundtable panel. That was Kyle Busch in the media center at Chicagoland Speedway on Thursday talking about this rough stretch his team has hit. One top ten finish in the last seven races for Kyle. What's going on? 
You know, I think it's partly because he races so much. And I, I appreciate the fact he loves to race, and he's very good at it. But the fact is, if you're going to beat Jimmy Johnson for the Sprint Cup Series title, I'm afraid you've got to give a little more attention to these guys in the Sprint Cup car during practice. Because if you don't, you risk having a weekend like you had. I think this is a very frustrated bunch right now. They, they are shocked by what's happened to them. What's scary is it looks a lot like he looked in the chase last year, and that was not very good. Something's got to change for them to get back in contention for the championship. They make the chase. I disagree, not? Ricky. Last year, he raced like every single weekend, and he did yep. great. But yep. what's different this year, we're forgetting about, there is no testing. So I think the teams that have the engineers and the computer modeling and did all that over the simulation work over the winter have a clear advantage, and that's Hendrick so if there's no testing, you got to make up for it in practice. And at the end of the year, he looked tired. Not physically, but the team was a little, just a little bit behind. And that was a contrast to what we saw in the early part. Well, don't forget, though, Kyle, a week ago, took a pretty big shot at well, Daytona. I, no so question. We were talking about that before. That could yeah. have some effect on no it. said he was sore for three days after that. And that catches up with you. Yeah. Uh, also at Chicagoland, Tony Urey Jr. spoke out for the first time since he and Dale Earnhardt Jr., his cousin, were split as a team. Uh, some of what he talked about were the external pressures, like media focus, that were a factor in the change that team owner Rick Hendrick made. Uh, now, if you look at some of the numbers uh, from the time when Tony Urey Jr. was Dale Jr.'s crew chief this year versus from since when the chain change was made, Jr. had three top tens with Tony Jr. as his crew chief, but averaged a 21st place finish in the seven races with Lance McGrew. Jr. has yet to crack the top ten. He is finishing on the lead lap a greater percentage of the time, but the average finish is pretty much the same. Reaction to what Tony Jr. said and where the sport's most popular driver stands at this point. I tell you, Alan, I thought that was a very telling interview this weekend with Tony. I stood there with him with several other reporters for at least 20 minutes. There were times when I actually thought he was going to break up when he said, you know what, I, I did all I could and I feel like I let my cousin down. And I think he's hurting. He's really hurting about what happened there and he's hoping that Dale gets better, you know, even though it's not with him anymore. Yep. But he did agree that it was time for them to split up, even though he did blame us for the <laughs> split up, but he did agree it was time. And I'm sitting here listening to this and thinking, you know, I know how difficult this is. Even if everything is, is you're around people you're comfortable with and things are flowing, it's still difficult. It has to be extra difficult if it's personal. And it was very personal for those two. And that's, that's something that most people can't speak to. Yeah, I mean, I disagree with some of the things that he said, though. I don't think the pressure is getting to Dale Jr. I mean, he's going through a slump like a lot of athletes go through. And right now, all he needs is to get back on track, one good finish, and it could springboard him. Right now, he's in a bad mood because he's used to finishing in the top ten, and he's not. So he needs to get that back on track. I don't think the crew chief made any difference. I really believe that if you're a team owner, you got to make a change. You're not going to change the driver, so he had to make a change to the crew chief. But it hasn't shown any difference to me. Uh, we talked about uh, in our Sports Nation poll those drivers who have wins this year but might not make the chase. You've got Mark Martin with the most wins, Kyle Busch second most, Matt Kenseth third most, yet all three are barely inside the top 12 uh, for points uh, in the race to the chase. What do you think? Well, the people said that they think Matt Kenseth's going to be the one that gets left out of the chase of those multiple race winners this year. Opinions here? Another way of me saying that is that Mark Martin and Kyle Busch will make the chase. I strongly <laughs> believe that. They're second and third in, in, in bonus points, and that's a great measure of speed. I am very surprised that Kyle Busch wasn't first on that list as, you know, so many people apparently dislike him, but I do think it's the right decision. I mean, yeah. Ford is just lost right now. You know, Kenseth is the last one to win in a Ford, but that was in February, so it's tough. Yeah, I agree right now with you, Rick. I go, right now, Roush Fenway cars aren't where they need to be. I'm sure Jack Roush is going to rectify the situation. I'm sure their engineers are working overtime, and we're going to have to see. They need to get their cars better for Matt Kenseth to make the chase. Up next, news and notes, final thoughts, and more as uh, we wrap up the NASCAR Now Monday Roundtable. Did somebody really call Mark Martin overrated? ESPN America puts you in the driver's seat this July. I drive by lead. With a Major League Baseball viewer's choice. Watching it. Choose between Reds at Cubs. They're going crazy here at Wrigley Field. And Rays at Blue Jays. Hey, my drive and a base hit into left. Vote now at ESPNAmerica.com and tune in Saturday the 25th to see the winning game live. An MLB viewer's choice only on ESPN America.
For live commentary, news and stats, scrum.com. Instant rugby anywhere. For the widest choice of official North American sports merchandise. For the perfect gift to collect or just to look good and support your team. Visit ESPNAmerica.com. Basque handball appears to be a more chaotic version of racquetball, but it's a sport that brings out all the passion of the Basque people. It's so big that the sport's gladiators are revered and emulated by the younger generations. Armed with only their hands and their unwavering competitive spirit, handballers face off night after night in the front on fighting for every point, as well as the fans' affections, since their loyalties can change that quickly. These competitors only know how to play one way, all out. This is the only way that they can one-up their opponents on the court, and in doing so, wow the crowd. In the end, the winners are the fans, some leaving richer than others, but they were treated to a great match where the competitors left it all out on the court. Stay tuned for more amazing games here on ESPN. The Midsummer Classic returns to St. Louis this July. See Major League Baseball's finest players take center stage. We're bringing you live coverage of the All-Star Futures game, the AAA All-Star game, the Home Run Derby. That one is hit high in the air. And the 80th MLB All-Star game live. That one is on its way. Goodbye. It's the MLB All-Star Week. Enjoy it all right here on ESPN America. And as soon as we're done with our NASCAR Now Monday Roundtable, we're going to talk some more about Mark Martin's big Chicagoland win. Flip on over to ESPN News for more on Mark Martin's Chicagoland victory. That's right after NASCAR Now is done. NASCAR Now, presented by the Home Depot. Visit homedepot.com. More saving, more doing. That's the power of the Home Depot. And in part by Nationwide Insurance, official auto insurance partner of NASCAR. A couple quick notes. Jacques Villeneuve didn't make out very well in the NASCAR Canadian Tire Series race Sunday. Uh, wrecked in the first lap, last place finish. Thompson, Connecticut, Saturday night. Ryan Truex passed pole sitter Steve Park with four laps to go. Won the Camping World East Series race. And uh, the car of Ryan's big brother Martin failed post-race tech at Chicago. NASCAR officials said the right rear quarter panel was too high. Usually decisions on penalties for that kind of thing come down on Tuesday. So, uh, our panelist here, Terry Blunt. Uh, wrote a book called The Blunt Report, NASCAR's most overrated and underrated drivers, cars, teams, and tracks, and so on. And I read the book, and, uh, and, and as I said, when I wrote the foreword of the book, you won't agree with everything he put. Did somebody really in that book call Mark Martin overrated? Boy, I thought we were going to get through this without that coming up. I did. You know, a funny story to that. There were a lot of people involved in the book who wanted me to list Dale Earnhardt Jr. as the most overrated driver in history. And I said, guys, I am not doing that. Someone will burn my house. <laughs> that is not happening. We finally settled on Martin because I thought, you know, he, he didn't win the championship. He's never won championship. He's just too nice a guy for his own good. That was the theme of it. And, I thought, and he's retiring. We're three days from print. He announces he's coming back to win for Hendrick Motorsports. And I said, oh, well, we'll see. How's that see. working out for you? Yeah. <laughs> it is so funny. I'm at the bookstore with my family, waiting for them. I grab the book. I sit down and read it to make sure I'm not one of the over overrated drivers. But uh, Mark Martin, my goodness, I think, wait a minute. It can't be. I could, Mark Martin? I've raced against this guy, and I think that's the advantage that I have or Boris has. You race against guys, you see things that you don't see from the grandstand or from the infield. He is exceptional. All right, couldn't let that go. <laughs> that's it. We're done. Goodbye. <laughs>